One minute to go. Huh? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna whack this thing. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? My voice does not carry very well. When you guys do talk this evening, if I could just make sure you speak up into the microphone sometimes when you sit back, it's hard to hear. Okay. We're not used to this, you know. <laughs> uh, we can all hide behind these screens too, I see. <laughs> to order the August 10th meeting of the Gardner Airport Board. This is our first time ever to be in a formal situation, so uh, bear with us. Let's all stand and pledge allegiance. <coughs> This is something new. Do we have any members of the public that would like to make any comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the consent agenda and we need to consider the approval of the minutes for June 8th. Has everybody read those? Yes. Then I would entertain a motion to approve them. I'll make a motion we approve the minutes from the June meeting. 
Do we have a second? A second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay? None. So, so well, this screen's fast. Okay, new business. Review and approve the financial. Do you all have a copy uh, of the financial in front of you? Uh, the first one I'm looking at is the Metcalf Bank, and this is two months worth. And you can go through there and see what all most of our made, most of our bills are paid to, which is now the central bank. We just still have Metcalf on this seat sheet, so. And you'll see that uh, the uh, at the end there we have a total of 150,808.32 in that bank. Now you can look through there if you'd like, and if there's any questions you have, I'll try to answer. shorted a page on mine so our balance is 147,660,705. I thought there was three pages on that. And it's through uh, 731. So uh, any, uh, any questions on that board? Well let me just go on to the other one then. It's the uh, Gardner, Gardner Bank, which we still call Gardner National. Now this bank account is generally it's where all the fuel sales come in. It's electronically deposited there. And as it builds up, uh, we're about ready to probably order another load of fuel, which will be somewhere in the $35,000 range. So it builds up and then it goes down when we, uh, when we, uh, by fuel. And at some point, we used to transfer money from the other account because we drew more interest in this one, but in the last few years, that hasn't made much difference. So, and any of the board have any questions on that? <coughs> then I would be, I'm looking for a motion to approve the financial report. I make the motion that we approve the financial statement. <coughs> okay. We have a second. I'll second. Any further discussion? If none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay? None. Okay. I see our first discussion item is from Laura. The audit findings. Good evening. I was just going to give you a rundown of the audit findings from the city's 2014 end of the year audit. Um, we presented these findings to the governing body in July. And I, I know that you're aware, but let me go through why it matters. Um, we just complete, as I said, we just completed our 2014 end of the year audit, and the city received an unmodified opinion on both our financial reporting and on our single audit, which is for grants. Um, unmodified is the highest possible opinion you can get. However, the city's auditors have noted that there's a significant deficiency in internal controls that's related to the airport. And a significant deficiency means that it's important enough that we need to report it to the governing body and that it needs correction, but it's not material enough to affect the city's highest possible audit opinion. However, 
the auditors say that if we don't get all of these things regarding the airport fixed next year, it's likely to rise to a level of what they call material weakness, which is a big deal, and that would affect the city's um, audit findings, and we would not get the highest possible opinion. And that kind of snowballs. If the city doesn't get its high, highest possible opinion on our financials, then we might prohibit our ability to pursue other grants, including those for the airport. And it might also adversely affect our credit rating, which would <clears throat> probably cause us to have less bidders when we issue debt. And if you have less bidders, then things cost more. So it's kind of a snowball effect. And what it really means is city staff has to make sure that we all work together to fix all of this deficiency related to the airport. Um, so you had a document called airport procedures that you had given to the auditors and our city staff, financial staff, went through that document. And by the way, before I forget, I want to introduce in the back, in the black shirt she's hiding back there, is Nancy Tordenaden. She's our fiscal services manager and she may be here for one of the follow-up meetings because I'm going to go on vacation. So I just want you to know there's other people involved here. But the city staff went through the airport's procedures pretty hard with a fine tooth comb. And um, I'll go through the auditor's findings real quick and then kind of touch on some of the things that we all need to work together on for the airport deficiencies. The audit finding for the airport that was a significant deficiency, which again means big deal but not, not a catastrophe yet, was there are lack of proper procedures and controls used to initiate, authorize, record, and process accounting transactions related to accounts payable, accounts receivable, and capital assets. There is also a lack of segregation of duties related to overall accounting functions, including cash receiving, deposits, and check writing, and the bank reconciliations are not performed and reviewed in a timely manner. So I was going to break that down just a little bit. Like I said, staff went through this. Regarding accounts payable and check writing, there are procedures that need to be implemented for additional review and verification of your invoices and expenditures and additional approval, greater documentation, and additional oversight of your expenditures. There also needs to be procedures implemented for internal controls, segregation of duties, and security procedures for your expenditures. Related to accounts receivable and cash receiving and deposits, procedures and segregation of duties need to be implemented for preparing and making deposits, collecting and receiving of cash and payments, and posting of receivable amounts into the financial reporting system. Additionally, procedures and reporting need to be implemented for aging, posting and reporting of receivables, that has a lot to do with your hangar payments. Procedures and segregation of duties, cross-training and additional review need to be implemented for bank reconciliations and any void or adjustment transactions that you're making to your uh, financial statements. And procedures for verification of, collecting of, receiving and reporting of, and accounting for all airport revenues need to be implemented. Additionally, for capital assets, guidelines and procedures for the identification of capital assets need to be developed, and additional procedures for recording, tracking, monitoring for impairment, depreciation of, and accounting for capital assets need to be implemented. So that was all related to the audit finding. In addition to that, um, I know you have some computer issues. I don't know much about it other than the auditors mentioned it. The computer housing, the airport association's financial information should be backed up to a separate system or storage device at least weekly because the integrity and availability of the airport association's financial information must be maintained at all times. And finally, staff would like to help identify and develop financial statements, including that aging receivable support report. So, I know that sounds like a lot, because it is, um, and I just wanted to give you a feel for it. There's a lot of work to be done here. Um, the city has evolved a lot, you're probably aware, 
those of you who have been here a long time, the city's evolved a lot and we do a lot of best practice things now and that's why we have our really good credit rating and our unmodified highest possible opinion of our audits. So you're coming along for the ride. So with that, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions or I can have Nancy, the fiscal services manager, answer questions as well, whatever you'd like to do. But that was just an overview of the things that we'll be working on. Have you got some uh, plan on how we should do the start with the payable? Well, we do have some thoughts, but I know one of the things we're going to talk about later tonight is that there's a work session on September 8th. And I think before we dive in and start rolling around in this considerably, it would probably be a good idea to get some direction from the governing body on that September 8th work session. And I know that you're all going to be invited to make sure you know it's there, but that mm -hmm. we do have some, but I think it's probably a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, we've got some for all of this, but it would be, it needs to be a cooperative. Yeah. I, uh, this year's audit, our, our computer went down right, right. The first of the year and it was down for quite a while and I and I think our computer system is a good system and, and Ray put it in and he did a very good job and, and uh, uh, had backups and everything on it but it was down for what, three weeks or so oh, it was for a week. <laughs> he was out of town and the computer was down and they were wanting information right and when we got it back up some of the, some of the items were jumbled jumbled on it and we, we were trying to find uh, bank deposits that showed they were December 31st of really October when we finally figured out where they were. Right. They were, they'd been in there and they'd been reconciled already, but it was, we had a quite a, quite a bit of work figuring all this out, so. Well, I think, I think mainly tonight, this is our first meeting together and I just wanted to give you an overview of kind of what they said and then we tried to narrow it down for you a little bit, a little more specific. I mean, that was pretty broad. Um, I think one of the things that, that needs to happen is once we get some direction from the governing body, anything that we all come up with for procedures, our auditors will be happy to look at before it's audit time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll know that we've got it all handled. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very proactive. We're able, yeah, they're a resource. They're not necessarily there to punish any of us. It's, it's to, another set of eyes and they're a resource just like anything else we have and the city staff's also a really good resource so just an overview for you kind of give you a heads up I know that we've had uh, every every year we've just uh, you know we've taken the information off of our computer and and come back and didn't say much of anything but this year we had a real problem and we couldn't get the information so right. I know that really caused some I think one of the biggest things is um, the airport associations and getting involved in a lot of higher dollar grants mm -hmm. and that triggers that single audit that I talked about. There's a threshold above which you have to pay for a single audit and we all need to make not only pay but you're accountable. The city is accountable, not even the airport association. The audit is the, uh, I'm sorry, the grant. The city is the sponsor. So the city is responsible to make sure that it's done right. So that's why we all need to work together on this. Okay. So at this meeting, with all the deficiencies that are listed, are we going to come up with like a priority list of things that need to be addressed and which order they address them? Or is this like, you, you don't move a mountain, you move one stone at a time. So right. I mean, is there a hierarchy of the priority list for you guys like to see the receivables? I only gave you the, pri this is the prior, this is the first phase. <laughs> I haven't talked about phase two yet. So this is the hierarchy. Right. This, all that stuff I just said, that's uh, to do now. As soon as we get some direction from the governing body on how they want us to proceed. So, so uh, that was phase one. It's a lot, but I've, we've got great staff and great resources. So it'll be okay. So what's phase two? Uh, compliance for your audit, I'm uh, not audit, for your grants. Um, you need to be trained along with city staff and elected officials and you're going to get officials and you're going to get to be invited to all those kinds of trainings and compliance, making sure your future lease agreements have all the right stuff in it to make sure they stay tax exempt for the city's debt that we have outstanding and there's all kinds of good stuff out there and it's pretty complicated. This was phase one with day-to-day -day operations to clean up this audit finding 
phase two will be moving into best practices. Are you smiling behind your monitor? I can't really see you. Okay. So just just kind of giving you the the overview. I don't I don't uh, we're good. It's all you know. We'll work together. You know, back in the the 80s, the city told us that we just needed to be uh, self-sufficient and leave them alone. Right. Well, let's see. That's how. That's like 90, 2000, 2010. We're a few years past that, and uh, as you all know, the city basically doubles every 10 years in size, and we grow and move into best practices. And the, the more we do, the more scrutiny it brings from the IRS, the SEC, and all those compliance bodies. You start getting into federal dollars, and then you really have to you have to have your processes and your procedures up to snuff. So with that, I don't, I really, I don't want to make you bummed or anything. I just, it is important. It's important that we get this handled. Uh, I guess we, I was going to bring it up this meeting that I think we were ready to look into hiring somebody to do our receivables <coughs> for us and get us into the 21st century on it where we can take uh, credit cards, PayPal, and just have somebody designated to do that is that something you might be thinking about I don't know I mean that would obviously because I work for the city mm -hmm. I, that would be direction from the governing body before I could offer my staff I would um, humbly suggest maybe you hold up on that till after the September 8th work session and see what they say do you, do you take credit cards for payments? we do at the city take credit cards mm -hmm. I will tell you that that is not exactly a small operation either I know that because there's all kinds of compliance when you're getting into people's data that way and having their you hear about all those hacking things on the news all the time that's no little undertaking to take credit cards and then you have to decide what you're going to do with every time a transaction swipe happens what are you going to do with the fees because there's a charge associated with it is the airport going to pay is the city going to you know the city pays for theirs right now because it is a very compared to the city's operations credit card fees are almost they're not even hardly registering as far as an expenditure for the city and we consider it a cost of doing business i suspect that would not be the case for the airport given the size of your operation we'd upcharge for it. pardon we would figure we would upcharge for it. right and you and you can but there's rules about that too okay. so now, that's yeah is there a, a different regulation for a a government body of over the private sector on, on, on taking credit cards and stuff like that? I don't believe so. I think co credit card compliance is credit card compliance. Well, Are you asking me something? Yeah. So. Yeah. Go ahead. I just out of curiosity, does the city outs outsource their uh, credit card management or is it another firm that handles all the... We have a merchant provider, okay. yes. Uh, but it's still the compliance. The, the IT compliance part comes right back to you. That we, we outsource that, the gateway and the merchant providers, but the IT staff, city IT staff, has to make sure we're compliant. And they work with another group, but they do have to make sure that all of the, I don't speak IT, all of the things you have to do for IT are done. Okay. Okay? So uh, are they going to require uh, uh, or come up with something for, like we receive the checks in the mail, mm -hmm. or people drop them off out there, and then we put them in the computer, then uh, take up here and drop them off for deposit. And now we have a receipt from the bank, and we have the deposit slip that uh, we turn in. So are they, are they going to require more than that? Uh, that's only one part. I think segregation of duties and, and also having to separate that from the bank reconciliations, that'll be part of it. Is we'll, we'll try to lay out a process and probably we'll need your guys' help about who does what to make sure that the person who reconciles the bank statement is not the same person that makes the deposits and the person who makes the deposits is not the same person who enters it into the financial software. So there's a lot of there's internal controls as well as oversight procedures and security procedures that all need to be not just for receivables but for your payables and your capital assets and your accounting and we need to make some financial statements for you and 
or you need to have them made, however it goes. I think that's a question that we wait until after we get the September 8th work session that the governing body has requested. Well, so I, I, would, I would guess our, our first priority, I think, would be to get our receivable managed some way, because that seems to be our biggest headache at the moment. It, uh, it my, my wife's going to get this QuickBooks in order again, mm -hmm. but uh, well, at, the, at that point, she'd just as soon not have to do it anymore. Right, right. I think, you know, uh, one of the things about compliance, <laughs> as far as your Remember how I talked about compliance with phase two? One of the things about being compliant is taking care of this quickly. That is actually a compliant uh, thing that they check. Um, it's, a, it's a benchmark. How quickly did you take care of things that you knew were a problem? So I think that right now it's August 10th and we'll have a September 8th work session and we're already addressing it. I'm standing here before you tonight talking about it and I, we're addressing it, we'll get it fixed. But I, I just wanted to, want to give you an overview of there's a lot here it's all this is phase one this is the hierarchy and um, it's important because while the airport is operating a little bit separately you're impacting the city's possible ability to pursue grants even for you and also for anything else in my do plus our future debt debt issuances and our credit rating so we're all in this together and we'll we'll work on it Sound good? We're good. Okay. Thank you. Well, the next item is the minimum standards for the Gardner Airport. And that would be Brad. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Question, did you, everybody has had an opportunity to look at uh, the minimum standards? I think Dave sent them out to you, a preliminary version, maybe a month or so ago. And then uh, I had a meeting, me, Dave, and uh, Public Works Director Faust and City Engineer Tim McEldowney also met and went through uh, the minimum standards and reviewed and, and checked on some things. and. Uh, had some assignments for myself, so I had updated them. So the information that you have in your packet is the latest, greatest from our previous meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was going to run through and just talk about some of the things that uh, we discussed more at length during our meeting. One thing also about the minimum standards is it's somewhat it's in line with what you're going to be doing with your financials. It's a best management practice starting to give you a baseline of, of how you will operate the airport and make a formal <coughs> procedure for uh, all sorts of things, how fueling operations go, what you can store in your aircraft, how you'll manage an FBO, um, skydiving operations. There are also is information about uh, lease terms and construction on the airfield and things like that. Most of these things are really common sense types of issues. Uh, things that you're probably practicing anyway, but this actually puts them down on paper in black and white. So this is our first minimum standards for the Gardner Airport. And so we'd like to make sure it's not something that's gonna hinder the way you operate and do business, but it also needs to be, like I said, establish that baseline where you can now feel comfortable uh, establishing certain thresholds of, of acceptable behavior and things that you can do out at the airport. I think one of the first things that uh, Rule 1-2, and please, you know, if you have any questions, uh, we can stop and discuss the issue. There's quite a few of these uh, these rules in this packet. I know there's 18 pages, and we are going to go through the whole thing. We're not going to stop on each one, so uh, I am going to stop on some of the ones that I thought were more important that we talked about. Um, first of all, Rule 1-2, we talked about creating an airport liaison, which will be a city staff member. That person has not been identified yet or that position identified, but that person will be the uh, sort of go-between between the city council and the airport board and, and help facilitate um, requests and council action forms that the airport may have. So that's something we thought was fairly important to have, and it's uh, Rule 1-2. 
Uh, rule 1-14 has the use with uh, ultralights and gliders, things like that. You do have that uh, uh, out at the airport. Um, one thing we're just saying is that these airport, these aircraft, we use runway 4-22 as most possible. I think that's your standard procedure, but once again, it's one of those things that kind of gets it down in black and white. Um, so you have a policy for where they should be operating and what runway they should be operating on. Is there any questions today? I mean, like, like I said, a lot of these things are sort of um, common sense sort of operations, um, but they're things that certainly come up when in the course of uh, operating an airport. Rule 1-33, and I know you do have some agricultural spraying operations. Uh, we did want to have something in there. They're very few and far between, as I understand it, but they do happen out there, so we want to make sure that they are uh, as a baseline, you're following all EPA rules and regulations. Uh, right now, because you don't have any wash facilities or containment areas, they shouldn't be mixing any chemical out there. Uh, if they are bringing in uh, fueling or loading chemicals on aircraft, that needs to be mixed off-site and brought on a truck and then pumped into an aircraft. So we want to make sure that that's sort of something you're okay with. Uh, but I think that's pretty important. That's you uh, need to put these minimum standards. I had a call last week about a person uh, asking if we allowed them to, to uh, spray out of the airport. And I told them exactly that, that they couldn't mix chemicals there, but they'd have to bring them in and then just pump it into the airplane. Okay. And we hope they bought fuel. Yes, absolutely. I wish you could throw that requirement in here. That <laughs> All well, itinerant aircraft uh, operators must buy fuel at the airport. I don't think we could get away with that one. Uh, also, Rule 1-34 is model aircraft. I know you've had some fly-ins with um, smaller aircraft, three-quarter size, things like that. Just want to make sure that all those things are coordinated with the airport board and, and people understand that you know they have to get your approval to, to bring those aircraft in there and operate them on the airfield. We had that. We had that. We hosted a model airplane deal here a few years ago, and we closed the airport to do that. And uh, it worked rather well. We were able to uh, donate, I think, about six thousand dollars to the food pantry on because we can, we supplied the concessions for the three-day event, so that worked real well. All right, well, terrific. Another thing, uh, some of these items are also geared towards things that may happen in the future so you don't scramble if something happens that you're not totally prepared for. We have a fuel flowage fee. Right now you sell and you're the only fuel provider out on the airport. So there's this rule doesn't apply at this point. But if some entity were to come out to the airport, and it does happen, it's not real common, but it does happen at general aviation airports where a company or individual will want to control the fuel and, and know exactly what they're putting into their aircraft so they'll actually put up their own tanks and pumps and things like that. Uh, what we're saying here is if somebody is doing that, uh, they will be required to still pay a fuel flowage fee to the airport. Uh, mm -hmm. So like I said, right now that's not an issue, but it does sort of look into the future that potentially may happen out there. So All right, I'm in section three now, construction on airport property. I think once again, a lot of these things are rather standard. Uh, one thing that we did talk about a little bit was making sure that in the uh, minimum standards of the building permit issued by the city of Gardner prior to construction um, is obtained and then all city codes are <coughs> including zoning and subdivision requirements. And I think you went through that with uh, uh, experimental aircraft associated hangar, but I think it caught some of those folks off guard a little bit that they had mm -hmm. all these internal procedures that they needed to follow and they thought they could just put up an airport or put up a hangar. So we we'll make sure that it's, that it's clear not just for uh, individuals, but mm -hmm. uh, nonprofit groups, anyone that may want to build or construct a hangar on the airport needs to follow those rules and regulations within the city of Gardner. Uh, there's a section four on environmental issues about what you can store 
in a hangar. Uh, hopefully there's nothing in there or in, in out the airport right now that needs these things, but uh, I'm sure there probably isn't. But once again, it does give you some authority to uh, go clean up issues or require removal of certain substances that may be hazardous to groundwater or uh, individuals. It also talks a little bit about uh, that the liability will stays with the tenant who caused the problem and it's not with the airport should somebody have brought something in there that causes <coughs> some long-term damage. One thing also in general procedures, section five, you want to think about how you want to inform all the airport tenants and where you're going to keep uh, the minimum standards so as soon as uh, these are adopted either by ordinance or with the city code or with the airport bylaws whether or not you will um, how you'll notify all the tenants at the airfield future tenants or itinerant operators or people that uh, you know, have any kind of business on the airfield about your minimum standards so that would be a key issue where you're going to keep these and how accessible they're going to be Probably be best to have them published on the city web page. You know, certainly have hard copies out at the airport. Uh, probably need to notify your hangar tenants that uh, these are going to be adopted or when they do become uh, official that, uh, that they're notified. Section six, I think really was some of these things that triggered this whole process was commercial skydiving operations. And there's been a lot of discussion and back and forth on, on how a skydiving operation may or may not work. Uh, there's one thing you can't do in a minimum standard, you just can't ban a use. You can't say we're not going to allow it, period. But you do have to um, give them procedure to follow. And then there's also reasons for denial. <coughs> if they don't meet those, then, then you do have a reasonable stance, a legal stance to deny an operator. Uh, one thing also I wanted to point out was Rule 6-3, uh, put a time limit when they could operate. Um, I've got noon to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. I don't know if that's something you seem reasonable. If you want to change those hours, it's certainly in your, your purview to, to recommend something like that. But uh, I think that's something that you, that you should note and have some discussion on. Hey, Brad, can we go back to item 5-2 for me? Sure. Uh, item C there is a hangar keeper's liability insurance. Tell me exactly what you're thinking there. All right, well, the hangar keepers that we talked about at our meeting is if you had an FBO or somebody like that that was actually storing other people's aircraft, they would have to provide insurance or damage that it may, they may have done or accidentally harmed somebody's aircraft mm -hmm. um, while in their care. And so that's what the hangar keepers is about. Yeah, they can get insurance releases on airplanes they're hangering. Mm -hmm. But usually they have hangar keepers in case they damage them. That is correct. And so the airport owner would, would not be liable or, yeah. or there would be some recourse for yeah. them to uh, pursue repairs or damages or something should an FBO or somebody who owned a hangar. Right now, once again, you all own the hangars out there, so uh, this one doesn't really come into play so much. But uh, if you were to get a full service FBO, somebody that did you know, aircraft storage, uh, rentals, charters, things like that, uh, this would be something you'd want to require in there. Okay, so this 5.2 has nothing to do with the current hangars that we lease to no, airplane not. tenants. Okay. No, not at this time. Yeah, I forgot where we're at on skydiving. Oh, well, we were just kind of, oh, well, I was on Rule 6-3 about the hours, potential hours of the skydivers when they may want to opt or when you may think it'd be a reasonable time period for them to operate. Um, I know. Up to the discretion of the board to set those hours? Absolutely. Saturday and Sundays, they're not allowed to 
Saturday is our busy day. I was thinking more like Sunday through Friday. Yeah, I don't. But I don't know that we can say that for sure. Either. Yeah. We, I re we don't have to approve them on the, if they conflict with our traffic or anything, do we? Yeah, well, that's the, the, you know, there's Rule 6 5, which is their grounds for denial. Um, so there are avenues there um, that you would go through a process and evaluate what they've presented to you, whether or not they meet those, those conditions. Um, I think the thing with the hours is, I do think. At your airport, Saturday is certainly a busy day, and it's a recreational use. So, those are probably the prime time for your fixed-wing aircraft uh, to be in the pattern. Um, but you can't, once again, you can't just say no skydiving. Period. At any time. So, you know, what would be a reasonable time? I think would be acceptable. Should they meet all these conditions? Now, these are so there's some fairly stringent requirements in here, but. Uh, certainly, if somebody, if they really want to put their uh, nose to the grindstone, they can get through all these things and, and potentially find a way to make it. But once again, um, but should should that happen, I mean, do you want to have a set time where you're not? What's your <coughs> the, the biggest uh, biggest help here? I think is item E. Mm -hmm. I mean. Whose discretion is that? You know, there is no suitable space on the airport to accommodate commercial skydiving. Yeah, we've gone through, and if you look at, there are some dimensions that I put in here about the size of a drop zone, which are recommended by the FAA, and the only area that would fit essentially at Gardner Municipal is the area of the triangle area between all three runways. And of course that would create a safety issue with skydivers pulling packs and chutes across the runway, an active runway potentially. So there's really no way out from that area without crossing a, a runway at some point. So, so in essence, you're right, the item P almost makes it impossible, but I think with New Century over here, I mean, having people parachuting a couple of miles away from their airport, <coughs> that's not a very good idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all of the traffic coming in, jets and everything else, just, uh, I think there's a big safety problem there if they try to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, safety is a big thing because I. I've had the opportunity to uh, haul the Golden Knights and a few other professional skydivers and uh, boy, going through the safety procedures to get that done, working with our safety officer and everything, it took a while to get the approval to even jump them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. And it's, it's a real, I mean, as much as safety protocols as they put into play, it's still kind of a dangerous activity. So, um, especially with the proximity of the new Century Air Center, the fact that the potential jump zone would be in the middle of the airport where people would have to cross an active runway. Uh, you know, another issue we, we talked about was even if something did happen and, uh, you know, emergency personnel would have to get out in the airfield, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about the fire trucks or even EMS vehicles are rather heavy. Um, that jump zone can be soggy, tough to go through, and they may not be able to reach them uh, very effectively. So there's a lot of reasons why it, it probably won't work, but you still need to develop a policy, uh, an overall policy on, on skydiving. And that's what this, this addresses. Okay. Right on. You had one point, Brian, that said uh, you were thinking about getting a legal review of this as well. So after it goes from here. Um, yeah, that's correct. Once we get the input from the board and make those changes that you guys might recommend, we send that to our attorney and have them issue a new drop board. Okay. We can talk about you know, Monday through Saturday. Can you say Monday through Friday? Sure, absolutely. Saturday is a busy day.
did you want to adjust hours or anything like that on that time frame or is that and once again it, it's it's total um, decisions you feel comfortable with as far as hours of operation mm -hmm. Ten PM to midnight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll leave it as it is and then we'll make that little change. Um, Saturday and Friday. <clears throat> we do have a section on insurance rule <clears throat> six twelve. And this also applies to, and this also applies to uh, skydivers, things like that. So, um, might want to take a look at that. Yeah, six fourteen is the drop zone requirements. And that does come from the FAA guidance, their advisory circular. That you should probably know. Final section is section seven. It's a rather lengthy one as well. Um, it has to do with fixed base operators. And once again, these doesn't really apply at this time to Gardner because you don't have a, a true FBO in the sense that this ordinance or this minimum standards addresses them. But as you know, FBOs um, repair aircraft, they do engine work, they do avionics, flight training, charters, things like that. Some of them actually have their own fueling facilities. So this kind of addresses anybody that might become a tenant on the airfield that has many or several of those types of functions under one roof. It gives you sort of a baseline to evaluate their procedures, whether or not they're uh, uh, operating properly, what are their best management practices. We want, certainly want to set a standard for what type of uh, operators out on the airfield. Okay, questions about those. Once again, uh, Rule 7 on FBOs doesn't really apply at this time, but it, it could. Um, so it's something you may want to address in several years from now, or maybe, maybe you don't ever have to, but I, I think it's good to have it in there just in case that uh, you, know, you do have an airport, 100-based aircraft, and and many air, airports that have that many planes do have a full service FBO on on air on site. And because your your relation, your closeness to New Century and Johnson County Executive, some of those services are provided there. But once again, it, it may be some point in your future, um, maybe something that somebody wants to pursue in Gardner. Anyway, that's all I had on the minimum standards. Uh, you have any questions? So, Joe. That's why there's a typo on 612B last year. It's correctly spelled. It's just not. Yeah. Kind of 6 12 Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it'll be there for 30 years. Right, you know. <laughs> Brad, ever, ever, I know when I read the other one, ever there was places where you, you know, hold the air, hold the city of Gardner harmless and this and that. And every any time you say that, have you also added in the airport board? I can certainly do are, that. You know, but we are a separate. Uh, uh, okay, I will make sure I'll make that note.
Sure. Yep. So this is nothing we need to vote on tonight. No, it's just it's a discussion item that maybe you guys need a chance to review the plate of terms. Correct. Okay. Do we need to bring it up at the next meeting and vote on it then? I, I think what we would do is um, we incorporate any comments and then we want to run it through our city attorney. Okay. And then I don't know if that'll be by the next meeting or not. So. Okay. I'll let you know. Buddy. Okay. So any comments? we have we need to get them into Brad I suppose or Brian for me and I'll get them in the whoever okay all right appreciate it thank all you right. thanks Brad. <coughs> Brad, well, wait a minute where are you going oh, that's right. All right. <laughs> well, you can't get away that quick off easy. Um, <laughs> yeah uh, additional items uh, you've got a couple grants with the FAA one for the demolition of the house on the property that you just bought. I did speak with Tim McLaren with the FAA. He's the Kansas airport engineer with the FAA. Um, he said he's going to send a notice to proceed or just an email saying your, your grant offer has been accepted so uh, you can proceed with the demolition of that structure. And then there'll probably be a separate one for the planning project. So you have two, two grants right now. Uh, one for the demolition and the other to start your airport uh, planning project. Uh, first step in the planning project will be to do a uh, survey of some of the structures around the airport, make sure and check their heights, things like that, so we know exactly where we can displace that threshold on the runway to make sure we've got proper clearances. Is the threshold displacement going to be something we can get done this fall? Well, we can certainly determine where that's going to be to actually change it in the field. I mean, you'll have to remark your runway. So um, whether or not we get to that point or not, I don't know. But uh, you'll have to change your runway markings and then also update the facility directory when it shows your new runway length. Yeah. I think that's something the city's wanting us to get done as soon as we can. Yeah, well, we will certainly address that. Uh, what about the first step of the process? What about our next uh, property we, we need to buy on the south end? When are we going to be able to do that? Well, probably we're looking at a, another grant cycle from now. So this you'll want to finish the two that you've got um, before you open, uh, open up a third one. Now, the demo of the uh, house should go fairly quickly. And because you know, we demoed that one, you know, it's it'll be down and a matter of days uh, once you've got the, has the asbestos been uh, cleaned up and taken care of? No, it hasn't yet, but it's going to be. Okay. So that'll be the first step, and then the demo will happen, and then it'll come down, and you, that'll be closed pretty quickly, I would think. That will certainly be done by the fall. Planning grants, because the nature of planning, the give and take between airport board, uh, consultants, city staff, um, FAA comments, things like that, take a little bit longer. So we're looking at nine to ten months to do uh, do that project, and then we would be back into looking at land acquisition for those two properties to the south. Uh, one thing that you do need to keep keep in mind also is the uh, farm property, or that it's about eight ten acres of ground that's on the corner of Waverly and 175th. Mm -hmm. um, it's just cornfield right now, but uh, that's something else I think you'll want to look at pretty mm -hmm. pretty hard as well and you may even want to consider doing that one before you do the houses I don't know it just depends on once again your own decision making process but uh, uh, well we're displacing our runway the only one that's hard surface again so I guess we thought we wanted to get that, that up for a board decision but I, I thought we were moving towards a, a, a north-south runway oh and you are you know, I mean, that's the part, you, mean, you just bought land down to the south and demoing is one of those steps, but um, I think there's some protection factor that that uh, property over on Waverly, 175th, also gets you by owning that versus right now it's... Well, uh, we own it, we can build some hangers on the, on it also. Well, that too. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, I believe we'll finish that, right? <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, email me or call me. Or uh, We're not leaving any money on the table, are we, with the FAA? 
No, actually, not. you've uh, used all your entitlement money for fifteen, and so. Um, well, here's my thing. one other update. Uh, Congress hasn't done anything surprisingly on the new airport improvement program, so we don't have a bill, so we don't know if you'll be getting entitlement in the next upcoming years. Um, one thing that is good about Gardner, you've got a lot of aircraft here, so you compete well for discretionary funds that the FAA gives out. So, um, so right now we're, we're kind of in limbo before a 20, 2016 airport improvement program. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, sir. Next item is that we have a uh, notice to the airman authorization form. Did you get that, Dale? You you had that. At I have one there. Yeah, it's in everybody's packet. Yeah. Okay. We need a. Who do we currently have on it? Well, I don't remember, but we need to get a couple people to sign up. I'll, I'll go on it. Okay. Yeah. These are people that can authorize, call in and, and, uh, and authorize a runway closure or uh, any notum for the airport. See, right now they have me on it. You want to be on it still? And Claude Hobby. Oh, okay. That was who was, that's the only two I remember being on it. So how do we remove Claude? I think this form supersedes everything. Any, okay, so any, any ones that are currently there will... Will just be wiped out and they'll put yeah. in whoever we send in. Yeah. Okay. A couple of you want to get on that? Well. Okay. Anybody else want? Deal. Would you like that? No, I'm still in with my runway on the other side. I'll be on the Yeah. Okay. Do I need to fill out the form? Because I'm on it already. Sounds like it. I well, think one form for everybody. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's fill one form and we put all the authorization You're out on there. Okay. Between you, between you three guys, you, you could have. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I just had a comment. You know, when you talked about that airport liaison, yeah. Um, something like this for issuing a note, they ought to be uh, on them. They should also have that authority as a staff member. So ah. I'm not sure who does the liaison, but. Uh, got a form, Brian? I got a form. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that one's settled. We got Dale, we got Ray, and we got Joe and Brian spelling this out. So. I don't know if you guys value. I don't know if you want to submit all to you, Dave, or you want to submit to me. That's just one form. Yeah, it's one form. I think maybe we'd give them to you this evening. Okay, the next item. On that one, I have the phone number. It goes directly to the flight service station without going, doing all the 1-800 brief and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, well, it's probably, it's probably right here. That's that one? Yeah, because I don't know if that's brief. If you've got that handy, you might have to put it on all the forms so we can go directly in to somebody and don't have to go through the... Uh, yeah. Weather briefing. Okay. Dave, I have a question on closing the airport runways. If you call in and put a note out on runways, does it have to be X's on it at that time? I suspect you would want to, but I don't know the rule on that. If we're going to close one, we better put an X on it. It takes about two hours to put the X's on. Mm -hmm. Minimum. That's on grass. Yeah. I think we we'll know when we want to put notums on the runway. Unless it's an emergency and we have an airplane down on the runway. And then I don't know. All we can do is call that in. You know, a temporary notum if there's an airplane on the runway that we can't get off the runway. I, I've called those in and we never did close them, but I don't know whether that was legal or not. But mm -hmm. The uh, flight service 
put out a note on it said it was closed. They just called me first before doing anything. Yeah, so I think they got to these people are probably forgetting it in their brief. Yeah. But I'm sure there'd be a time period where you wouldn't want to have that because it's only after that time. Yeah, sometimes. Well, if I could, sometimes it don't matter. I'm sorry, if I could get to speak into the mic. The discussion was to yeah like what time to call it in yeah the, I, uh, I think if we have a, if it's an emergency situation you would call it in and immediately prepare to put the exes on the runway otherwise I, we would know when we we're going to close it monday morning say for uh, reseating the runway and it's going to be closed for 90 days so monday morning we put the x's on it and call it in close Simple procedure, I think. So then uh, you do it in the reverse when you uh, remove it, like remove your X's first and then remove the notum after that. Okay, our next item is on the, under discussions a hangar rental. Now, when our when our computer system went down this winter, it also jumbled up some of our. Uh, hangar rental uh, mainly it was the uh, it, when it came back up it put some of the archive names back on hangers that were that they had rented earlier and there was a few other things jumbled up so uh, and as we as we were looking at this uh, we have started as of about three months ago to go through a complete uh, uh, what would I say going through and reviewing all of our hangar rentals and all of our rent agreements we, we got our hangar list up to date Ray did that we, uh, we have, have now uh, we're going through the process of going through all of the all of the hangars and sending out overdues to people that are overdue and uh, just reconciling the accounts. We have found some, uh, we have found some items that were kind of jumbled up. When the computer went down, we fixed all those. Uh, the first run we made on the hanger list had two hangers, uh, Two, two, two different hangers that had n two numbers on them. There was two 64s, there was two such and such, and we found that that, that in particular was in archive. We had one person that was in, uh, I think it was 64, it may be another number, and it brought it back out when, when, the, when we got the computer back up. So we had the current man person in there plus the person that hadn't been in there for years. So. So we've reconciled all that, and we've got a good hanger list. We've we've got a good receivable list. We think we're going. We are. We've sent notices to all the customers. Must sent us looked at them and just uh, sent us checks because they knew they were behind a month or two. We have some that uh, that uh, we have sent for reconciliation. We can go back to 2009 because that's when we started QuickBooks. So if somebody needs that, we're going, we can run a sheet to 2009 and show them where we think they're wrong and ask them if they had any deposits because it's a list of all their check numbers and uh, uh, see if they can prove that they've paid any, any of those that we don't have on our list. Now, we have found where in several cases where we have doubled invoiced for a month or for three months and so we are reconciling all of that right now and uh, uh, we found that on several occasions when one renter left and the next one moved in there was a month where there was really nobody in the hangar but the building went on so so we're, we're reconciling all of this and we're coming up with a 
good receivables list. And as I was mentioning earlier, as soon as we get this done, or we could at any time, we are thinking of getting a, pro a professional service. But I guess we're waiting until our next meeting with the city to see what their direction, what direction they think we should go. So, but we're getting that up to date as we speak. I have two, two on the list that are we feel are flagrant. I asked Joe, and he agreed to take these a month ago or several months ago. I've made a, I've made the list, and I'd like to go over how we did that with you after the meeting, if that's legal. So when you take this and present this to these fellas, they need to tell us what they're going to do. So I have these, and I'd like to just show him how we came up with where we think that, you know, we are with them, and then they need to tell us if it's any different. So, so we're working through the hangar rental agreement, and uh, that kind of takes care of delinquent rent payments. Uh, Linda's agreed that she'll help, help me get all of this up to date again. And then once we're done, we would like to get it to some kind of a service whether it be the city or we found that we found a person a company in Baldwin that said they could do it uh, it's, it's about a five percent charge which would be probably less than a less than a thousand dollars a month they would they would handle all the payments and uh, and deposit them in our account and do whatever except credit cards so that's something uh, I want on the, your agenda for the uh, meeting in September if I can ask that is that proper yeah I think in the uh, September report session we'll talk about uh, the yeah. audit findings okay. and, and options there <coughs> and I think we'll get direction from council okay and then with the, the next board meeting in September we'll we'll have it on the Okay. All right. When were those letters sent out, Dave? The letters were sent out. The uh, they went out to everybody. Didn't you get one? No. You should have. Maybe I'm paid up. Uh, well, you still well, you should have got a letter because. No, I haven't seen one. Today. I have That's a copy of I have a copy of the letter here. The what I sent out a letter with the, with the overdues and the letter stated that uh, all which we had already said that we needed for years, but it kind of kind of slacked off on this. It's, all payments must be made by the leasee and include the hangar number. That's a big problem. If they don't put the hangar number on it, then it might get misposted. We found some misposts because we can't guess all the time with which hangar it is. So if it don't have the hangar number on it, we just don't accept it. And if the, and the sub leasee cannot pay the rent, he must pay the whoever he's subleasing it from and they pay the rent and uh, of course all the payments are supposed to be made by the tenth of the month we need corrections to mailing address <coughs> phone numbers and emails and we here's another one we must have the airport board must have access to all hangers if we do not have a key to your hangar bring one on to us we will be checking this too so and then for the ones that we saw behind we included a statement through July the 15th and we asked them to check their records and if we have misposted a check send us a copy of the check front and back so we can rectify your account we've had probably 10 or 15 working with us and so uh, that's where we're at on that I had a chat with uh, hangar number 55 and he has brought me two or three checks uh, extra now he said he would start trying to make up so he's bringing me some extra in every month okay i saw that that's one of them that's in my folder here huh? that's one of them that i was yeah what we got like two two or three two two right now he 
say, I don't know if it's proper to give names out no. over the. Uh, uh, just, just reference the hangar numbers. Yeah, you. it's hangar uh, 81 and hangar 55. Hmm? So we need to see if we can get those resolved. So that's it on the delinquents. We're, we're working on both those. Airfield, anybody got any questions on that? Board? Airfield and ground. Jim. Uh, do we want to try to restate that north-south <laughs> runway again this year? Uh, especially in the area on the uh, touchdown on 1-7 up, there's about uh, two and a half acres again that needs to probably be interceded. If we, if we if we close the run or we have to close the runway probably through the fall if we do this right? right we can do that without disturbing what grass we have I have a well Johnson County has a uh, overseeder now that we can mm -hmm. lease I've got the necessary paperwork and uh, we'd have to make an, uh, some kind of an envelope of time where we could go between the, like Monday and Tuesday or something like that Hopefully I can do that in one day. Mm -hmm. I've got a soil test uh, pending now. And also uh, the, uh, the grass seed, I've contacted a company for that. Mm -hmm. It would take a minimum of 500 pounds of K31. And we won't know how much fertilizer until we get the soil test back, hopefully this week. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you how much expense that would be. I would imagine without knowing uh, for sure, imagine we're talking like at least $500 for grass seed and a couple hundred dollars for the, the rental of the machine. And that's through the uh, noxious weed department here in mm. Olathe. Uh, when, we do the, if, when we do this though, we're gonna be closing uh, closing the run, runway for the fall, I guess. That's the downside of this. But if we don't close it and fix it, well then there's just gonna be mud again in the spring. What's your thoughts, guys? Have we ever been successful at that? Oh, no, we've had droughts that screwed a couple of years up. Mm -hmm. yeah, at least three, three years, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, well, you know, we can grow grass, but the airplanes land there and, and they land on the same spot every time. And so it's it's only gonna last for a while. Well, I'm not gonna get the bugs. Yes, sir. We know it's, of course it doesn't get near the use because it always made the three, two, one. It never shows the where the seven. Mm -hmm. Sir, these aren't really divots, they're, they're areas. Uh, when they're landing out there, of course, uh, I'm, I'm sure if you've been around aircraft, you know that whenever they touch down, the wheels aren't turning yet. So consequently, uh, on, a, on a normal landing, I would estimate about 20 foot of skid for, for landing. And if you had a yard, that, that's basically what we have. We have a yard that's K31, and if somebody went across your yard 100 times, Month or traveling 50, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, you probably call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the situation we have. What do other airports do? Same battle? Or are they? Uh, I don't know if any other airports in the area that has grass runways that has the amount of traffic that we have. There's a lot, of, a lot of traffic out there. And all the tailwheel airplanes prefer the grass and they prefer the north south over three and two one. In the Kansas City area, by the, by the way, ever, everybody comes to Gardner for the grass 
front runway, so we get a lot of use other than our people. So, if we're going to do it, we, we need to get ready and do it by the middle of September, or before, or before. So, this is a this is a meeting to decide that really. Like you got to do something. With that? So I think you have to do something. Well, that's, we've done it many times before. And yeah, what is it? For a little while. Any way of improving it this time around? I mean, last time I asked. Not, we're, not, we're not going to. This, this is a. Uh, it's not a. You don't have to rough it up. It's a. What do you call it? A pasture seeder, isn't it? They call it an overseeder or interseeder. Overseeder. So we're, we're not stirring the ground up. We're, we're just. We're. Uh, Putting slots in. Yeah, just putting slots in it. And yeah, but the one time we did it, it was so dry. I was wondering if, you know, if the city or somebody else had a tank or anything to water it. You know, if we don't get the rain. That's we haven't had that problem this year, have we? <laughs> no, no, we spring. <laughs> Number seven, actually, ground. It's, not, it's, a discussion, it's, a, it's a discussion item. I mean, if, if this is something that in your day to day operations that you would do, like order fuel yeah. or see runway, then that's something that you would do. But as far as the board taking action on it tonight, uh, that we do not have on the agenda. Yeah, okay. Well, we just, I guess we just need to agree that we need to do it. And it's kind of a because that is, we got it. We have to do it this, do it this, in the next month or not. So. Are we okay, guys? I'm okay. Okay. <coughs> we need to do that. Okay, that takes care of the ground. Did you have anything else? Well, yeah. we're still working on our auto fuel pump. Oh, we just need a report on the auto fuel, which has been a real. That's a discussion item, but it's a. It's a, growing. Uh, problem and I just well I'll just tell you what's what's happening and you can help me when you the uh, our auto fuel that's our 91 octane has been the pump has not been working well so we we hired a company a, a local fuel company to come in and, and they said well you need a new pump <coughs> and so we bought a pump a rebuilt pump and uh, but it's still once we put the pump in, it still wouldn't pick up. It wouldn't, and so the next step was we had to get to the tank so we could see where the leak was, sucking air somewhere. So we actually uh, tore up the asphalt and went from the from the pump to the tank so they could they could get the lines there and they could pressurize them and they could check the line in the tank. They could check the line going to the to the uh, pump itself, and they they were good, right? But <clears throat> while we were doing that, we we found our vent line was was uh, rusted, rusted through in places. So we had to go ahead and replace our vent line, and uh, which goes clear over to the hangar. So the, our pump, our 91 octane pump operation is still not working right, and we're working with some possible check valves or something that I, yeah. so anyway it's an ongoing thing but we haven't had 91 octane for six weeks now so that's just a we're probably a, a probably a ten thousand dollar repair when we're done but it's something that we have to do so that's just for everybody's information uh, what else did we have? Next is the, the water meter and the cycle. Oh, the water meter. And, and what that is, is right now there's a Johnson County 7 water meter on the side of four properties. Um, I talked to Johnson 7, they'd be happy to remove it. No charge to the city. Normally they would charge someone to remove it. Hmm. Um, I guess my question is do we want to go ahead and leave it there for now? It's just a small monthly fee for that. Um, I was looking at it more from a reestablishment of the property once we demo the building. Um, which I kind of want to get your thoughts or discussion on the, uh, the, the need to keep the water meter there in the future. Mm. Well, I actually, I actually 
talked to Brad about that, and when you look at the ultimate clear zone, there's nothing hardly left on that east side that we would could use a water meter for in the first place, unless we bought property to the east and uh, put in an airport restaurant or something. So it's really doing us no good. I don't think we can use it for anything. Has anybody else got any comments on this? No, if it's in the clear zone, we can't use it. I yeah. don't see any so point in keeping it. They'll take it out. We're fine with it. I work with John from Seven on that one, so I thought I'd probably keep it in place until we get everything we established out there. Okay. Very good. And then as far as the demo, uh, we were looking towards the end of August. Uh, you know, whether it's been in the market. Okay. See, you've or, we've already talked about the workstation at the 8th of September at 6, and that would be right here? Yeah, it's, it's still held here in the council chambers. Um, and I will say there were several new council members and uh, questions and requests from the public on various airport operations. The Gardner City Council did request the work session. Um, so city staff has scheduled for 6 p.m. On September 8th, which is Tuesday. Normally the council meets on Monday, but Monday the 7th is Labor Day. And so the meeting's been shifted to Tuesday. Um, staff does anticipate questions on how the board envisions the airport growing in the future. Um, so we would definitely encourage you guys to attend if you guys are available. Okay. Alright, what's what's next? Other business. What's that? Do you know if you guys had any other business that we didn't have on this? You know, I've got one thing. I, I think we should get us a telephone number at the airport and put an answering machine on it. Uh, possibly given some other, maybe the answering machine should could tell what the fuel prices are because I, I get calls. What's the fuel prices of Gardner? You know, or some of them could be answered, and maybe we, since there's nobody there full time to take calls, then if we had an answering machine and a phone number, at least we could put some information on the machine, and maybe that would take care of some of the questions. That's something to think about. We don't have to do anything about that tonight. That's the only other thought I had coming up here tonight. So, any other business? Guys, Jim? I'm fine. Dale? Looks like mm -hmm. it. Okay. All right, Peter. All right. Then uh, need a motion to adjourn. I'll motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? No. Okay. We're adjourned.